love being out in the woods in God's creation. I think I've always believed in God, but I haven't always known who He was. As I got older, I was really confused about how to know God and how to please Him, how to find myself in the world. And then at, at one point, I found myself among some Christians who really live by faith. And during that experience, the thing that I really found is that the Bible is like a road map that God has given us that helps us know who we are and who He is and where we're going. When I first became a Christian, when I was 21, the book of Genesis was really important to me, especially the first few chapters that explain how we were created. God made us in His own image. That means we're good and we're creative. We're made to have a relationship with God and with other people. Yet soon after creation, there was the fall. Brokenness and sin, or whatever you want to call it, came into the world and into each one of us. And with the fall came curses. A curse against man and his work, against woman in her relationship with her husband and her children, and a curse against the serpent. Man and woman were driven from the garden and not allowed to eat from the tree of life. But along with the curses, God also gave a promise that someday, somehow, a child from the man and woman, one of their descendants, would overcome the serpent. The serpent would wound his heel, but he would crush the serpent's head. So that's the beginning of the story. But I'm also interested in the end of the story, the book of Revelation. It's a hard book to read because it's full of visions and symbols that are difficult to understand. But they're pictures, and I began to have an idea that it would be fun to make a painting and put them all together. I told a friend about this, and she said, well, why don't you do it? Are you afraid it'll be too hard? And I thought for a minute, and I said, no, I'm afraid it'll be too much fun. And I laughed, and, and I decided that even though I'm not a trained artist, I'm uninhibited enough that even if it looks like a seven-year-old did it, I'll take my paint and brushes and lay out here on the canvas the images described by John. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, also wrote the gospel in three letters. He was one of Jesus' closest friends and was with him at the crucial moments of his life, the transfiguration, the Garden of Gethsemane, at the foot of the cross, and the empty tomb. He was a leader of the church, and at the end of his life, he was exiled on the island of Patmos, which is off the coast of modern-day Turkey. It was during the rule of Nero. He was a cruel and wicked Roman emperor who persecuted the Christians and used them as human torches to light up his garden. It was a terrible time for the church. So John, as a pastor and elder, wants to comfort the church, encourage them and urge them on to remain faithful witnesses no matter what trials they're going through. The story begins on the Lord's day. John says he was in the spirit when he heard a loud voice behind him that sounded like a trumpet and it said, write down what you see and send it to the seven churches. He turns around to see who's speaking and there was someone who looks like the Son of Man standing in the middle of seven lampstands, which are the seven churches. His hair is as white as snow, and his eyes blaze like fire. His face shines like the sun. He's dressed in a long robe like a priest, with a golden sash around his waist, like a king. Even his feet are glowing bronze. In his right hand he holds seven stars, which are the angels of the seven churches. His voice is like the sound of rushing waters, and out of his mouth comes a sharp, double-edged sword. John is so afraid that he falls at his feet, but the man reaches out his right hand and says, Don't be afraid. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. 
I am the living one. I was dead, but behold, I am alive forever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. After this amazing encounter, John looks up and he sees a door standing open in heaven. The trumpet voice says, come up here and I will show you what's going to happen. For a second time, John says he's in the spirit. He goes through the door and he finds himself up here in heaven in front of a beautiful throne. Someone is sitting on the throne, someone who looks like precious jewels. There's an emerald rainbow surrounding the throne and 24 elders on their own little thrones with crowns on their heads and dressed in white. Seven lamps blaze in front of the throne and John sees something that looks like a glassy sea, but right now it's filled with a lot of other things. In the center are four living creatures, the same ones found in the first chapter of Ezekiel. One looks like a lion, one an ox. The third has the face of a man, and the fourth is a flying eagle. They each hold a harp and a bowl, and day and night they never stop singing, Holy, holy is the Lord. The one who sits on the throne has a scroll in his right hand, and it's closed up with seven seals so no one can read what it says. A mighty angel cries out, Who is worthy to open the seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth can open the scroll to look inside. And John begins to cry. But one of the elders tells him to stop and look because the Lion of Judah has triumphed. John looks and sees not a lion, but a lamb, a lamb who's been slain. And all at once, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, and 10,000 times 10,000 angels start to sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. He is the one worthy to open the scroll. John has just had a glorious experience seeing God seated on the throne with all of creation, the angels and everything in heaven and earth singing his praises. And the Lamb is going to open the seals and reveal what is inside the scroll. One day I was at church on Good Friday and during the service I all of a sudden I had a little vision in front of me. I saw a little picture and in that picture my husband and I were we were at a retreat center or living in a retreat center or something. I wasn't quite sure but I knew the word retreat and my husband and I were there and it was a, a beautiful, peaceful, wonderful place. And once I had that vision then I started doing different things to try to make it come true. And as I moved towards that vision, it changed. Maybe the vision didn't really change, but my perception of it, my understanding of it changed. And what I thought was a place that was going to be a retreat center actually became our home. And here, here I am there right now. And what I learned from that is that when you see something off in the distance, you, you sense a calling from God, you know a direction that you want to go towards. As you move towards that, it isn't just a straight line. In fact, I, it's more of a line that goes down, up and down, just like if you were um, going to hike up to a mountain peak. As you go up the hill, you realize, and, and you can see more of, of, what's, of what reality is. You see that there's another valley in front of you and maybe several more until you really reach the goal of that mountain peak. And that's what happens in John's vision as the seals begin to open.
The Lamb is the one worthy to open the scroll. As he opens each of the seals, he reveals the terrible consequences that were set in motion by the disobedience of the man and the woman and the serpent in the book of Genesis. John watches as the Lamb opens the first seal. He hears one of the living creatures in a voice like thunder say, Come, and he sees a white horse whose rider wears a crown. He holds a bow and arrow and is given power to conquer the earth. In the same way, the second seal calls forth a fiery red horse whose rider holds a sword. He has power to take peace from the earth and make people kill each other. The third is a black horse with a rider holding a pair of scales. One of the living creatures cries out, a piece of bread for a day's wages. The fourth seal is a pale horse with two riders, Death and Hades. They are given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by wild beasts. These four horses represent things we already experience on earth. When the Lamb opens the fifth seal, John sees an altar in heaven. Underneath it are the souls of people who were killed because of their faith. They call out to God, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge the people of the earth and avenge our blood? This is like the Israelites when they were slaves in Egypt. They cried out to God, and he sent Moses to deliver them and lead them to the promised land. The next seal is God's response to the cries of his people. When the Lamb opens it, there's a terrible earthquake, and the sun turns black, and the moon looks like blood. Stars fall, and the sky rolls up like a shade. Every mountain and every island is moved from its place. This is so horrible that everyone, rich and poor, slaves and free, hide themselves in caves. But instead of repenting and calling out to God for mercy, they cry to the mountains and rocks and say, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. As I studied the book of Revelation and charted the events of the seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls, I found a progression of intensification and a telescoping of one set of events inside another. It's as if the things that happen when the sixth seal is opened are described again in more detail in the trumpets and then again in the bowls. Before the last seal is opened, there's a pause. And John sees four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. They're holding back the winds until a seal has been put on the foreheads of the 144,000 servants of God, people from each tribe of Israel. Throughout Revelation, there are two different groups of godly people mentioned, the 144,000 who are connected to Israel, and then the great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language who are the church. This all-inclusive phrase is used seven times in the book, and this is the group John sees next. They stand before the throne in front of the Lamb. They're wearing white robes and holding palm branches. John is told that these people are the ones who have come out of the Great Tribulation. That's the terrible things that are happening on earth. Together with the elders and the living creatures and all the angels, the people in white robes fall down and worship the Lamb. They will never be hungry or thirsty again. The Lamb will be their shepherd and lead them to springs of living water. He will wipe away every tear. This is a little foretaste of the victory scene John describes at the end of the book, a glimpse of the goal we're all waiting for. Now we come to the seventh seal. The book of Revelation is full of sevens. In biblical times, the number seven represented perfection and completeness. When the Lamb opens the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. Seven angels are given seven trumpets. And when the first four blow theirs, terrible things begin to happen, things not pictured in the painting. A third of the earth burns up. 
a third of the sea turns to blood, a third of the waters are polluted, and a third of the day is without light. Then the fifth angel blows his trumpet, and a star falls from the sky and is given a key to open the abyss. Out of the smoke come locusts that look like horses prepared for battle. The sound of their wings is like chariots, and their tails sting like scorpions. They're told not to harm plants or trees, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They're not given power to kill, but to torture them for five months. And the agony is so awful that people want to die, but they can't. Then the sixth trumpet sounds, and two million mounted troops are released to kill a third of the world's people. But the rest of the people still refuse to repent they continue to worship demons and idols, to murder and steal, to practice sexual immorality and magic. But after these gruesome images, John's given another glimpse of heaven. It's so comforting to see how God gives us hope in the midst of disaster and reminds us that his purpose is not to destroy, but to save. John looks and sees a mighty angel with a rainbow over his head. His face blazes like the sun. He's robed in a cloud and his legs are fiery pillars. He plants one foot in the sea and the other on land. He holds a small book or scroll that lies open in his hand. Then he roars like a lion and the voices of seven thunders speak. John is about to write down what he hears when a voice from heaven says, no. Instead, he's told to take the scroll and eat it. It isn't yet time for the contents of the scroll to be revealed. Although we've seen many horrible consequences of the fall, there are still more to come. Not long after we moved here to this place that is really the fulfillment of the vision I had of, of my husband and I in a retreat place, our oldest son and his wife and their three children moved not too far away. Then a year ago, circumstances changed and they needed to move a long ways away. I was really sad. and miss them so much and so one of the things that I did to comfort myself really was I started writing a children's story, a, a story for them. And my daughter-in-law drew pictures to illustrate the story and I used the woods here as the setting for my story and I wrote about a little girl who was only six inches tall and her parents were embarrassed by that and so they, they couldn't handle having such an odd little child so they left her off on the side of the road but then she was adopted by the squirrel family and I watched the squirrels and the birds and and created this really comforting story of how this little girl found a new family where she really felt she belonged and, and at first I just thought this was you know a little story for children but um, the more I wrote it and as it developed, I, I realized that it was my story um, and maybe your story too of how we, we don't always feel like we fit where we are in the world or something is not quite right. Um, but then if we're really blessed, we, we find a new family. And this is what John sees too in his vision that there, there's a separation between people, between nations, between families, and a separation between people and God. And, and we have this deep longing in us. John's vision shows us the pain that is there, and yet it calls us on to the fulfillment of the promise. Mm -hmm. 
In Genesis, when the man and woman chose to believe the serpent instead of the word of God, they set in motion not only personal consequences of sin, but also systems of evil. And now, as the seventh trumpet is about to be blown, and the seven bowls are about to be poured out, John has a vision of the cast of characters who are operating behind the scenes. Now he's given a reed like a measuring stick and told to measure the temple of God and count the worshipers. He sees two mysterious figures called the two witnesses. Some scholars compare them to Moses and Elijah who appeared with Jesus at the Transfiguration. They're also called two olive trees and two lampstands, images found in Zechariah. When anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and they devour their enemies. For three and a half years, they have power to hold back the rain, like Elijah, and turn water into blood and strike the earth with plagues, like Moses. But when they're finished with their testimony, a beast comes out of the abyss and kills them. For three and a half days, their bodies lie in the street of Jerusalem, the place where their Lord was crucified. People from every race, tribe, language, and nation gaze on the unburied bodies. They're so happy the two witnesses are dead that they celebrate by sending each other presents. But after the three and a half days are over, God breathes life into the witnesses and they rise up in a cloud to heaven while their enemies look on. At that very hour, there's a terrible earthquake in Jerusalem that kills 7,000 people. But this time, unlike the other instances in the book, the survivors repent and give glory to God. And then the seventh trumpet blows. There's lightning and thunder and hail and an earthquake and God's temple in heaven is opened to reveal the Ark of the Covenant. Next, John tells us that a wondrous sign appears in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She's about to give birth to a male child who will rule all the nations. But immediately a second sign appears, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. With its tail, it sweeps one-third of the stars out of the sky and flings them on the earth. The dragon stands in front of the woman so it can devour her child the moment he's born. But when she gives birth, the child is snatched up to God's throne and the woman is given the wings of an eagle so she can flee to the desert. The dragon, who is also called the ancient serpent, the devil, and Satan, is hurled to the earth. It pursues the woman and spews a river of water from its mouth to sweep her away, but the earth protects her by swallowing the river. The dragon, enraged, goes off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. This is another key phrase in Revelation, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It's the reason John gives for his exile on Patmos. And the martyrs under the altar and the two witnesses and later souls who've been beheaded were all slain because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Next, the dragon goes and stands on the shore of the sea and spawns another beast this one looks a lot like the red dragon. It also has 10 horns and seven heads, but its crowns are on its horns and not its heads. On each of its heads is a blasphemous name and blasphemous words come out of its mouths. The beast looks like a leopard, but it has the feet of a bear and a mouth like a lion. The red dragon, the one who was thrown to the earth, gives his power to the beast. This is the beginning of a counterfeit trinity, an unholy godhead. One of the heads of the beast seems to have a fatal wound, very much like the lamb, but the wound has been healed. And the whole world 
all those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, is filled with wonder and worships the dragon and the beast. Next, John sees another beast, the completion of this horrible trinity that is called the false prophet. This one comes out of the earth. It has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. It works on behalf of the first beast, doing miraculous signs and deceiving everyone on earth, forcing them to receive a mark on their right hand or forehead. No one can buy or sell anything unless they have that mark. The mark is the number of the name of the beast, 666. Just as seven is the number of perfection and completeness, this trinity of sixes is three times short of perfection. But again, we leave these horrible creatures and turn to a vision of hope. John sees the Lamb standing on a heavenly mountain. With him are the 144,000 people who have the name of God written on their foreheads. Everyone in heaven is singing a new song and the angels announce that the hour of judgment has come. John looks up and sees a white cloud with someone sitting on it who looks like a son of man. Remember, that's how John described the first vision he saw back on the island of Patmos. This son of man has a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand that he uses to harvest the earth. The grapes of the earth are thrown into the winepress of God's wrath, where they're trampled outside the city. Blood flows from the winepress for 180 miles and runs as deep as a horse's bridle. Next, John sees a third great sign in heaven, seven angels, with bowls full of the seven last plagues. These are called the last plagues because with them God's wrath is completed. The angels pour the bowls out over the land and the sea, the waters and the sun. Unlike the trumpets when only one third of creation was affected, the bowls touch every living thing. The fifth bowl is poured out on the throne of the beast and the world's plunged into darkness, but still people do not repent and the supernatural enemies of God do not give up without a fight. With the sixth bowl, three evil spirits that look like frogs come out of the three wicked beings, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The evil spirits are demons that perform miraculous signs so they can gather all the kings of the world to fight against God at a place called Armageddon. Now we come to the seventh bowl. Just like the events before the seventh seal and at the seventh trumpet, when the seventh angel pours out his bowl, there are flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and a tremendous earthquake, the worst in all of history. The great city splits into three parts, and the cities of all the nations collapse. Every island is moved, and no mountains can be found. Huge hailstones weighing 100 pounds fall from the sky. All of these terrifying events, all of these consequences of the fall, could lead people to repent and cry out to God, but instead they curse him. And a loud voice comes from the throne and says, it is done. Last week, I watched a robin build a nest right outside my bedroom window, and I just felt so blessed to have this little, little creature um, choose to make her home right next to mine. Uh, and I was over at a friend's house down the street, and she's got an, an apple tree with a low crook, and there was a nest, a robin's nest, right in there. And while we were standing in her yard talking, the bird flew away, and we went over and peeked in and we saw three beautiful blue eggs. I just thought, how do they make such beautiful blue eggs out of their little bodies? And, but then my friend told me that the next day there was only one egg. And the next day there weren't any eggs at all. And they found 
some shells back on the other side of the yard. And she said that she thought another bird had come and stolen those eggs and, and eaten them. And I know that they're just birds, but Jesus said that, you know, his father knows when even just a single bird falls to the ground. It made me think again of, of the brokenness in this world and how, how things are just not, not right. There's, there's so much pain and suffering and destruction. And there's evil. And that's what John is, sees next in his vision. He sees this terrible destruction that, that seems to be running rampant through the world. The first time John says he was in the spirit, he was on the island of Patmos, and he saw someone like a son of man who commissioned him to write down this vision and send it to the churches. The second time he was in the spirit, he was in the throne room, and from that perspective, he watched as the consequences of the fall unfolded. But now, for a third time, he's in the spirit, and one of the seven angels carries him away to a desert where he sees the true nature of evil and watches as the final battle takes place and the book of life is opened. In the desert, John sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. It's the beast covered with the blasphemous names. She's dressed in purple and covered with jewels. She holds a golden cup filled with the filth of her adulteries, and she's drunk with the blood of the saints who bore testimony to Jesus. On her forehead is a mysterious title that says, Babylon the Great, Mother of Prostitutes. And two whole chapters of Revelation go into great detail about the terrible economic woes that take place when Babylon falls. I think it's interesting to compare the two women described in John's vision. The woman in heaven is dressed in the sun and stars and the moons under her feet. She gives birth to a male child who rules the nations. The devil tries to drown her with the waters, but she escapes with eagle's wings. Babylon, on the other hand, is clothed in expensive fabrics and covered with jewels. She's drunk and called the mother of prostitutes. She rides on the scarlet beast, and her sins are piled up behind her, and she sits in many waters. The angel tells John, the many waters are the tribes and nations and peoples of the world. The enemy tries to use those things to destroy people. He's used that water to try to overwhelm and drown the woman giving birth, but God as those waters are calm and clear in front of the throne, and he offers us the water of life. As the vision of the fall of Babylon comes to an end, John hears a roar of victory. The great multitude in heaven shouts and rejoices that judgment has come and wickedness is overthrown. Then John sees heaven standing open and there appears before him a white horse with a rider called Faithful and True. His eyes blaze with fire, and he has many crowns on his head. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, and his name is the Word of God. His robe is dipped in blood, and on his robe and thigh he has this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the one who treads the winepress of God's fury. Behind him are the armies of heaven, riding on white horses and dressed in white linen. Then John sees the beast and the armies of the kings of the earth who are gathered to make war against God. But the beast and false prophet are captured and thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of the people are killed with the sword that comes out of the mouth of the rider. After this, John sees an angel holding a great chain and a key to the abyss. The angel seizes the dragon, who is the ancient serpent, the devil, or Satan, and he binds it for a thousand years. This is what people call the millennium. He throws the devil into the abyss 
and locks and seals it over so it can't deceive the nations until the thousand years are ended. During those thousand years, people who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and the Word of God, the people who had not worshipped the beast or received its mark on their foreheads or hands, come to life and rule with Christ. But when the thousand years are over, Satan is released from prison for a short time. I find it interesting to wonder why Satan wasn't reformed during those thousand years of peace. And why weren't the people of the world happy living in peace while they were ruled by Christ? But that isn't what happens. What does happen is that the devil gathers people from all over the earth for battle. They march across the earth and surround the city of Jerusalem, the city God loves. And fire comes down from heaven and devours them all. And then the devil is thrown into the lake of the burning fire where the beast and false prophet had been thrown. Next, John sees a great white throne with every single person who ever lived standing before it. The sea gives up the dead who are in it, and death and Hades give up the dead who are in them. The book of life is opened, and the dead are judged according to what they have done. The last thing that happens in the final judgment of the world is that death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire, along with anyone whose name is not written in the book of life. This fiery pit is the most troubling part of the painting. I'm glad to see the counterfeit trinity and death and Hades destroyed forever, but I don't like to think of people being thrown into the pit. I'd much rather have everyone joining in the songs of praise in front of the throne, and I'm sure that's what God wants too. But this fiery pit is part of the vision John received and part of the words of Jesus, so I hope you will take it to heart. One of the intriguing things about the book of Revelation, which I take as a challenge, is that right in the very beginning, there's a blessing that says, blessed are those who hear these words and listen to them and take them to heart, because the time is near. And the end of the book also has a blessing, blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and, and obey them. I think that John probably put that in there because he knew we needed something to prompt us really to read this book. And it's such an important um, element of the story to know what the end of the story is. It, it gives you the courage to go through the middle parts of the story that are more difficult. The seals have all been opened, the book of life has been read, the final judgment has taken place, and the dragon, the beast, and false prophet, along with death and Hades, are banished forever in the fiery pit. And now, for the fourth and last time, John says he's carried away in the spirit. This time he's taken to a great and high mountain where he sees a new heaven and a new earth with a holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, dressed like a beautiful bride to meet her husband. The city shines with the glory of God like a precious jewel. Its shape is a perfect cube, 1,500 miles wide, tall, and high. The foundations of the city walls are precious stone. It has 12 gates, each one made of a single pearl. John tells us that there's no temple in the city because the Lamb and the Lord Almighty are its temple. The city doesn't need the sun or moon because the glory of God illumines it, and the Lamb is its lamp. The gates of the city are never closed. Nothing unclean ever enters it, only those people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Book of Revelation started out with John in prison on an island and progressed through the terrifying consequences of the fall 
in the final destruction of evil. Now John's vision ends with a beautiful city, a home that comes down from heaven where people live at peace with God forever. The angel shows John the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, that flows from the throne of God and the Lamb. And on each side of the river grows the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, one each month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. John writes, no longer will there be any curse. This takes us back to the beginning of the story, to the book of Genesis. When God created man and woman, he put them in a garden with two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they chose to believe Satan instead of God, so their lives were cursed and they were cast out of the garden. But now, at the end of the Bible, all the curses are undone. The serpent's crushed and the bride and her husband are united. They live in peace forever. They eat from the tree of life and they drink from the living waters. There's no more pain or death. All things are made new. At the very end of the book, John hears Jesus say, Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, who is to come the Almighty. Do not be afraid. Whoever is thirsty, let them come. And whoever wishes, let them take the free gift of the water of life. I'm grateful that you've taken the time to come with me and look at the painting and my prayer is that these images will stay with you and that they'll help you as you read the book and as you take it to heart so that you might experience the blessing that God has for you.